This meeting is being recorded. Okay, I think we are starting, right? So hello from Jeanne Slipke Memorial. Uh, Memorial is dedicated to the family that during the Second World War rescued Jews. Uh, it's a contemporary museum uh, here. And that's why we thought that this year would be, a, um, you know, amazing opportunity to actually reflect on how contemporary art thinks on topics of genocide, the Holocaust and human suffering and war. Uh, at this moment at the museum, there's an exhibition by Eva Thelaure, uh, actually dealing with this topic of the memories of uh, childhood traumas uh, of the history of the Second World War that is uh, forgotten and found. Uh, so that's why, as you see, um, we, have, uh, uh, we have a lecture uh, that is uh, called Contemporary Art and Museums uh, on Topic of Genocide and uh, Holocaust and Horrors of the War. As we understand, it's a, um, it's a very wide, topic in a way because um, uh, because unfortunately human suffering is not ending and it's not ending not in a war in the Middle East and not uh, not ever uh, in a human history uh, so uh, uh, we've invited as a museum two people who are actually thinking and reflecting about the also the uh, history of the 20th century and these uh, issues uh, so the first um, the we would like uh, Professor Dennis Hanos, who is uh, from Latvian Academy of Art, uh, to join us and to give us introduction into this subject. And then the main uh, lecturer is Esther Kayema. I'm very very glad to finally uh, meet you and see you. Uh, and Esther is from uh, from London. And she holds a bachelor's degree and MA and uh, MRS in uh, uh, contemporary art theory from Goldsmith University uh, in, in London. Uh, and she currently researches topics of ontology, cultural heritage, and witchcraft. Uh, so when she's not uh, crafting academic text, she is also working on collaborative creative projects and fiction writing. So I'm actually very uh, glad that we have this combo. Uh, I hope the people who will listen uh, will send us also questions and or reflections. Uh, so uh, Professor Dennis Hanos, uh, floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Lolit, and good morning to everyone. And thanks for the invitation to uh, to be able to, so to say, summarize today uh, a, a very, it's, it's indeed a huge topic, as you mentioned. Uh, but I will probably concentrate on Germany, as I'm now in Berlin, the city which is uh, full with uh, signs of uh, politics of memory or politics of commemoration. And it's uh, the capital, which uh, itself is a huge site of memory. Uh, the concept of the site of memory was developed actually in Europe, in France in the 80s. But uh, I would like to start with the idea if um, 
if it's possible at all to um to try to reflect on uh, the uh, catastrophe of the holocaust and the second world war on uh, various forms of uh, crimes against humanity uh, on totalitarian past uh, in Europe, in Western and also in Eastern Europe. So meaning the Nazi Germany and the uh, Soviet um, power. In fact, it seemed uh, after the war that um, some of the intellectuals uh, who were exiled from Germany and were returning back, uh, they supposed that after such a huge and um, the crime, which is almost not to, do, to be described, it is not possible to create any artistic forms. And for example, Theodor Adorno in his uh, early critiques of culture in 1949, so four years after the war, he stated that it would be barbaric to try to write poetry after the concentration camp in Auschwitz. So after Auschwitz, there would be no a more cultural production, so to say, because poetry, of course, is uh, one of the most uh, fragile ways of how you express collective emotions. And poetry is kind of symbol of a peaceful period, uh, prosperity and cultural community. So no texts, no poetry, no artistic um, reflection. Later, he corrected this idea. And of course it is, and it was possible to write poetry after Auschwitz as a form of reflection on how it was possible in the civilized European, uh, so to say, culture uh, to um, destroy people's lives uh, in uh, such terrible ways, uh, the way how you used actually the progress and technical skills and industry to, uh, to kill millions and millions of people. Of course, other artistic forms also followed, but uh, I think it was, uh, at least for Germany, uh, the way how the commemoration of these crimes was uh, partly forced upon them from outside uh, and the allies, first of all, the British and American, so say political education introduced uh, the shift of uh, memory to the society, which for almost uh, 12 years was participating in um, destroying people's lives. And um, parallel to the destruction of Jewish culture and community to Jewish heritage, uh, many, many other groups were silenced and uh, killed and put to different types of uh, concentration camps during this regime. So I'm talking about LGBT people, about Sinti and Roma, uh, about uh, people uh, with different disabilities. Uh, all of these were, so to say, uh, the victims of uh, Nazi legislation. So um, the great silence, so to say, after the war uh, was the uh, collective reaction of Germans, and it was the period of Adenauer, uh, which also produced new ideas, new forms, and new language to reflect on what was kind of silence, because uh, this was the period when partly the Nazi elites also joined the new uh, government, the new democratic government, uh, which uh, was, so to say, um, shaped by the uh, memory politics from the outside. But the real change or shift of memory politics also in public space, in arts, uh, was possible uh, thanks to the change of generations. The new generation of artists, uh, poets and writers who actually was born after the war and had nothing to do biologically, so to say, with the crimes of their nation, they um, started to reflect on these crimes because it was their own um, private intellectual and artistic choice to deal with this uh, uh, terrible past. And here I would like to uh, mention only two people who uh, until now shape the German memory politics of the Holocaust in artistic field. It was, uh, of course, Joseph Beuys and Anselm Kiefer. So Beuys, so to say, the 
um, the one who uh, still joined the uh, Wehrmacht uh, army and also created some kind of his own uh, fake biography, which he uh, tried to express in his works. Uh, as uh, we know, the Auschwitz demonstration uh, is a kind of uh, what we would call the vitrine of the Schaufenster, as the Germans say, with different objects which are very controversial if we talk about the memory of uh, uh, Jewish people who were uh, who perished uh, in Holocaust. So some wax, um, so to say, the remembrance of how you produce the soap out of bodies and the dead rat and some uh, blood sausages, some mixture of uh, very um, so to say, unpleasant, very provocative elements of uh, German national collective identity. Of course, it was also kind of scandal in the Western German society. At the same time, um, he, expired, he uh, inspired the Anselm Kiefer, who is a younger artist and who started actually in the late 70s and early 80s. Um, and here we see that commemorating the Holocaust is a, a multi- uh, multimedia process. So poetry, again, after, uh, so to say, the um, skeptical idea of Adorno uh, survived and actually was used to uh, to remember, for example, the Todesfuge by Silan, uh, the one who actually, uh, writing in German, was reflecting on the experience of being uh, in the concentration camp. Uh, he survived. And at the same time, uh, his texts on the black milk, uh, on uh, graves and on uh, female images of uh, German national identity and the Jewish culture, also feminine, all of this inspired uh, Kifa to create uh, his works uh, and uh, works which actually also um, created kind of parallel discourse for commemoration because the other part of course later in the 80s and 90s was so to say leaving the museums and going into the streets and at the same time the German uh, commemoration culture is now present in uh, urban space. It is um, so to say this uh, famous stumbling blocks uh, or the uh, um, uh, how we call it here the uh, Stolpersteine uh, we meet it everywhere in uh, large cities and small cities, and uh, everywhere we meet also the traces of how other people denounce Jewish, uh, uh, so to say, fellow citizens and destroy their biographies and their lives. Uh, I think one of the contemporary um, issues which uh, are uh, very topical for German uh, commemoration culture is the uh, commemoration of Holocaust in the so-called post-migrant society, post-migrantische Gesellschaft, uh, which is uh, also the issue for education system and for cultural activities. How can you actually transmit the um, the discourse on commemorating the Holocaust for those who came from um, non-European cultures who are now part of the German society, uh, who are taught in schools the European history, but their cultural background, in many cases, is the background of non-democratic societies in Arab countries, where anti-Semitism, which is now exploding also on the streets of uh, Germany, uh, was a part of curriculum or the part of family life, everyday life, and also family uh, memories. So um, there is also the issue of uh, clash of different memories. And um, I would probably summarize this very short introduction by saying that um, the state politics of commemorating is uh, uh, actually at the moment not from this out. It's the internal German society issue and the German society has accepted its collective guilt and responsibility. It reflects on these issues of how the society could uh, do this, how could they destroy lives of so many, many people. Um, it is now the issue of uh, politics in everyday life uh, on the uh, level of uh, small towns and cities and also the political elite um, is always um, very supportive uh, 
for Jewish, um, so say, um, memory initiatives. And of course, now the um, the terror acts of Hamas uh, showed how fragile the commemoration politics in uh, Germany is. But there is uh, one very important thing, which in many cases is missing in Eastern European countries, is a political will to accept and to go on reflecting on uh, the responsibility of the society. So it is uh, the way how German society is now facing the uh, commemorative challenges. Well, this was, I think, very, very short introduction into the contemporary politics, art politics in uh, in uh, Germany. One more thing, one last sentence is that the diversity of society groups, communities, also means the diversity of how we remember Holocaust. And here um, there is also new debate in Germany, which is again multi-directional. Uh, the idea of the plurality of uh, memories, um, meaning that um, the to remember uh, genocides of other groups outside Europe is also the issue of post-colonial Germany, uh, also in arts and in politics and uh, in uh, so say intellectual debates. Michael or Michael Rothberg is the one who suggests that if you try to create the space of uh, cooperation and not uh, the space of uh, contest, it means that you include other tragedies, other traumas, and then the traumas begin to uh, to tell their stories to others. And then it means the intercultural dialogue is possible because it is very important to be able to share traumas. And this is how the German, is, German society is now trying to deal with it. Well, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dennis. And uh, um, yeah, that was very useful reflection. Uh, and now we will zoom in from this uh, uh, overview into the more specific, uh, you know, theme on a um, topic on contemporary art and museums, and the uh, you know heavy violent human uh, heritage that we have uh, on topic of uh, genocide and Holocaust and horrors of the war. So uh, Esther Kayama, thank you for joining us, and and um, we are very happy that you can actually. Uh, give us this uh, this uh, talk uh, because it was very very much needed. Yeah, so floor is yours. Thank you. Sorry, just had to unmute myself. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's it's definitely been long overdue. I've I've been wanting to to do a talk um, with the uh, Lipka Memorial for a long time. And thank you very much to Dennis as well for this wonderful introduction. It was so dense and I made so many notes for myself as well for my research. Um, my topic, um, kind of my presentation is more about the museum space. Um, I've also, um, got some examples of artworks that um, have to do with the topics of genocide, the Holocaust, and the horrors of war. Um, and the uh, main idea of it is that the fragility, fragility of knowledge, fragility of museums, fragility of institution and archives. Museums have always been a target for destruction. Um, in 1992, Jacques Derrida presented a talk and um, issued a book that was called Archive Fever, where he contemplates um, about the institution and the death drive of the institution. So death drive um, is a concept that was coined by Sabina um, Spielrein um, in 1912, and then appropriated by Sigmund Freud. The idea of the death drive is that um, of the opposite of the life drive. So. It's always accompanied with aggressive attraction towards the condition or the state of being unalive, something unorganic, the end. Um, something that's born ultimately has to die. So Jacques Derrida wrote that the desire to collect, the desire to archive, the desire to build a museum is only um, able to exist in juxtaposition with the death drive. So 
with the thought that something might be destroyed. Um, there, there are forces that exist to eradicate, to remove knowledge completely, and knowledge only exists in contradiction to those forces. So I repeat myself, museums have always been a target of destruction. Here we see a photograph taken at the end of August 1939, when 203 vehicles transported artworks from Louvre to the provinces. And during the war, the, the artworks continue to be transported from one chateau to another, depending how close the, the looters were. Um, in the photo, we see the very last piece uh, that left the museum, which is Winged Victory of um, Samothrace, which is um, a very eerie piece to, to be removed from an institution as well. Museums have always stood as guardians. They are not only archives, they're also spaces of knowledge, protection, education, spaces where we can share history, share stories, we can preserve as well. It's a very important point um, of museology, preservation of not just chemical preservation of um, works, but also preservation of, again, knowledge and cultural heritage. And also, um, museum not only serve as physical archive and physical repositories, but also as repositories of memory. However, we've also seen so many battlegrounds that stood exactly where museums are. Museums became spaces um, that were covered in scars of conflict. We can see that, for instance, with the Palmyra Museum, with the Iraqi National Museum, uh, the Winter Palace and Hermitage as well. Um, and these events only highlight the vulnerability, the fragility of cultural artifacts, of cultural knowledge. It is especially in those times that we as professionals and admirers really understand the, import the importance of having the institution and having the institution protected. But not all artworks are based inside the white walls. The Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe by Peter Eisenmann and Biro Hapold, located in Mitte neighborhood of Berlin, um, consists out of 2,711 blocks, reminding us of potentially tombstones. The blocks are located in such close proximity to each other that when navigating through them, the individuals can't move with groups, sometimes even with pairs. So one is inevitably left alone. Alone with the thoughts and emotions, um, uh, and only alone with those thoughts and emotions, one can really contemplate about the horrors and terrors experienced by millions of Jews and millions of people during the Holocaust. And only then in this individuality, one can really perceive what, what potentially it felt like. Here we have an artwork by Shimon Ati. Um, it's a very interesting artwork um, that he started assembling in 1992. It became a series of projections on buildings, in particular in Germany. So he would uh, project images of fronts of, for instance, here we have a Hebrew bookstore onto the building, um, capturing a scene, perhaps something that happened there only just a few decades ago. Um, it was really interesting, the reaction of people who lived in those buildings, because Shimon uh, famously wrote that people would open their windows and scream at him and say that they are the right um, residents of those buildings. They live there um, by all laws. Um, apparently one lady who lived in this exact building opened the window and said that it's lies. There was never a, a bookshop in this building. Um, the, the whole series of it is called The Writing on the Wall. Um, and then we have this artwork by Christian Boltanski. 
Um, also very important artwork when thinking about um, contemporary art and its response to uh, genocide. He initiated these series, they're all called monuments. Um, and collectively, they're also sometimes referred to as lessons of darkness. Uh, he centered pictures of what it looks like ordinary children to symbolize life's fleetingness and normality of things, childhood. In this context, childhood em embodies a reminder um, of the absence of something that was and suddenly became nothing, something that only exists as a memory, but memory also doesn't mean much without artifacts that can bring us back to reality or back to, back to the truth. Um, normally, uh, these monuments are displayed in museums or churches, um, very dimly lit as well in dark rooms in order to create this haunting, terrifying ambience. And the, elect and the light bulbs that you can see in the picture as well, they're supposed to remind us of maybe also your type candles. So candles that in Jewish tradition um, honor and remember the deceased that we only light on their memorial days. Uh, the title of this specific work is Odessa because Christian Boltanski's father, um, his roots came from Odessa. Um, and these particular children in these photos uh, are known to be celebrating Purim in France in uh, 1939. He, the artist, he manipulates the photos so that they become kind of this organic installation, but the essence of them really remains um, very haunting. He himself was born Catholic in Paris, but he always honored his Jewish roots. And he thought a lot about his grandfather's um, history of being born in Odessa himself. He says that his work concerns the reality of dying so I think just the idea of it, the reality of dying is really terrifying when we think that the reality of dying, unfortunately, is not always in the old age and from natural causes. Um, and we go back to the, to more of a public kind of art, which is the Holocaust Tower by Misha Uman. Um, this installation is, this architectural installation is based inside the Jewish Museum, also in Mitte district of um, Berlin. And while the museum is a must-see location for a lot of tourists, the contents of it and the architecture and the design of it reminds us of the truly claustrophobic pain this pain of um, trying to perceive the unreachably, unperceivable past. And standing inside of this tower, you'll find yourself in complete darkness. Um, apart from the only, the small, the short, the, the still very bright slit of light at the very top of the structure. This haunting experience of standing there in silence um, is simultaneously filled to the brim with pain of the past. And here we have an artwork by um, Colombian born and raised artist, Doris Salcedo. This artwork was a um, temporal installation at the um, Turbine Hall of Tate Modern in London. Um, as you can see, the floor of the Turbine Hall is um, slit with a, with a deep crack. The idea behind it was to show the true embodiment of segregation, or as um, Salcedo herself says, the vision between creed, color, class, and culture that maintain our social order precariously balanced as it um as it is on the 
precipice of a coyote, sorry, chaotic void of hatred. So the idea of it was to show what's it like to stand on the wrong side of the crack. Um, she takes the name Shibale from the Old Testament, from a very uh, profound story about um, men of Gilead who demanded a test of speech. So they demanded the um, Ephraimites who wished to cross the Jordan to pronounce the word Shibaleth. And if it was pronounced incorrectly with a different dialect, or if they seemed that perhaps they never saw or heard the word before, um, they were destined to death. The idea behind the naming for Salcedo is to depict also the unreasonable expectations that are placed on people from segregated communities. And this is also really, this particular installation is also very interesting from the spectator's point of view. Um, as I, if I remember correctly, there were six people who were injured, um, injured by, by the crack. Um, and when people were asked if, if they wanted to proceed with, with some kind of um, formal complaints, everyone said no, because uh, all, all of these people who got injured really understood that perhaps it was uh, supposed to be part of, part of the installation. You really had to feel the struggle. Um, and here, um, I'd like to talk about the exhibition that um, closed yesterday, actually. It was an exhibition that was called Wearable Memory and Body Techniques, um, featuring Solomon Levitanos and Luba Monasterski. It was curated by myself, my German colleague, Ricarda Messner, and our colleague from the Kim Gallery in Riga, um, Zane Onskula. The exhibition is uh, dedicated to biographies of two individuals, both of whom lived um, predominantly in Latvia. Solomon Levitanus uh, was born in uh, Kaunas, but moved to Riga shortly after when he was still a young boy. He was a very uh, well-known person in Riga. He published textbooks on pattern making every year from 1902 until 19. Um, 36 approximately. We know that they were translated into Latvian, Lithuanian, German, French, Polish, Russian. We know that he had three ateliers. He had an atelier in Riga, in um, Paris, and in Lodz. Um, Him and his brother, they also owned a shop on Gertrude Street, shop where um, they would distribute fabrics and also books on pat pattern making and also magazines from all over the world. Um, we know that um, Solomon Levitanus won um, numerous prizes internationally. Uh, we have documents of him uh, receiving awards in Brussels, in Mariupol, in Rome, Rostov, but also from Paris and various other locations. For Levitanus, what was really important was the, here, here are some of his books, um, was the anatomy of, anatomy of a human being. So we can see in the middle of this image, um, in the open book, there's a, a small image of a man with a hunch. So for Levitanus, it was important not to hide the hunch or not to create a pret a porte um, jacket, for instance, but to create a special jacket that would help a person to remain healthy or to not decrease um, the health condition. Uh, he put a very important um, role to the instructions as well. So all the instructions are really playful, but at the same time, really educational and really um, he, he had a huge emphasis on uh, knowledge distribution. And you can see it through the tone in every language that you read or any language, at least that we were able to find at the National Library. Um, you could hear the playfulness in his tone. Here, um, 
you can see the example of a um, diploma that Levit Danos issued to people who completed his course. This one was issued in Paris. There is a stamp at the bottom of it, of it and you can see his surname and you can see that it's from, um, from a street in Paris. We knew about the existence of the diplomas, but we, we really struggled to locate one. And then just a couple of weeks before the exhibition opening, we found one on eBay. The condition of it is really interesting too. Um, you can't really see it from this exact picture, but the diploma itself is cut very brutally from all four sides. It's very interesting because this is obviously a very precious um, document. So we kind of developed this speculation um, about this document because also we turned it upside down and the fabric on, on the bottom side of it was very pecu peculiar. We tried to kind of guess whether um, it was some kind of uh, ornament or perhaps that's that's how Solomon decided to to ship them. But actually then I came to a conclusion that it could have been either a pillowcase or a wallpaper. And we know that a lot of Jewish people would hide their documents behind the wallpapers before evacuating from their houses. So this is just a speculation that this could have been um, such case. The person who received this diploma, we can see his name is Mr. Aaron Pigula. And we have learned that he, um, unfortunately has also perished during the Holocaust. He he was murdered in Auschwitz. Here we have um, photographs of Levitanus' passports, which was also a very, um, um, very uh, precarious find. Uh, the, the work that we did was really community-based. It was community-based research. So we managed to find a couple of his passports and we even found um, one visa for Germany in his most recent passport that would have expired after his death. And there at the top, we see a, a little photograph from a family archive, which is also a very uh, precious precious uh, artifact because we, we knew from uh, stories of Solomon Levitanus um, children and his um, granddaughter that he would go to Urmal every summer for a holiday. So here, this is exactly what we see. We see a little um, photograph of him going up the Tourida Street, if I'm not mistaken. And underneath, we also see a very precious photograph of Solomon Levitanus on the left with his son Maximilian on the right. The second person whose um, story was really important to us in this exhibition was Luba Monasterski, who came to us accidentally. She came to us through a German researcher whose name is Norbert Weber, uh, who asked us if anyone has ever done any particular artistic research on Luba Monasterski. And one of my colleagues, Sana Onskula, embarked on that journey. Um, Luba is a reminder that while design was predominantly the domain of white men, there must have been space for talented exceptions. So a Jewish woman uh, who, which was very unheard of for, for, for where she worked. Um, in 19, she was born in Riga, but in 1926, she was accepted to um, a Bauhaus school in Dessau in Germany. Uh, she left in 1926. And let me see, I think I have a photograph. Here we can see a small photograph on the, on the top right side. It's a very famous photograph from the Bauhaus school. Um, depicts people who took the weaving class. So Bauhaus had many different directions. They had the architecture class, they had writing class, they had design class, they had art class. And also interestingly, they even had the nutrition class, but women were only allowed to attend the weaving class. And in this small photograph, 
um, next to Luba is actually um, the, the person who's depicted next to Luba is Annie Albers, who was Josef, who became Josef Albers' wife after she completed the, the studies. At the bottom, at the right bottom, we can see a group photo of the young students celebrating perhaps end of year party or just a regular get together. And on the left side, we see um, a little collage that um, confirms that uh, Luba Monasterski was a student of Josef Albers because this was the exact assignment he would give to his um, preparatory class students. Here we can see um, some examples or some samples of Luba Monasterski's work. This one is particularly interesting because this is a um, example of um, textile pattern created for the sofa. So we know that um, after Luba Monasterski finished the, the education at Bauhaus, she worked for leading factories at the time. So we know she worked for Pausa AG and Mona Lo Bear, which was a really big company. We know that she mastered the artistic design for decoration and upholstery, as you can see here. But what we also know from testimonies of uh, survivors from her family or and from her colleagues is that she just wanted to be a designer. That's all she wanted. She wanted to live in Germany, to live in Berlin, and to work as a fashion designer. But in 1933, um, Luba Monasterski was uh, forced to leave Germany and forced to go back to Riga. She really didn't want to. She wanted to stay in Germany, um, but she was forced to leave. Um, we know that after that, she tried to work in Latvia. She still had a little atelier and um, she, she tried to do some work and we even created this fantasy that perhaps Lua and Solomon befriended each other and knew of each other. But in uh, 1941, um, at the beginning of the year, there was an announcement or a little note in the newspaper that she was selling her sewing machine. So that's how we kind of can figure out that she wasn't doing very well professionally. And then she was um, arrested and unfortunately was part of the part of the Jewish people who were murdered in Rumbola. And here we have two paintings of her. They're actually drawings, charcoal drawings by a Latvian artist, Krista Zuzilo, who is a really interesting artist, very interested in in Jewish history, especially in Latvia. Here she drew two eyes of Luba Monasterski and we have located them on, on two different walls in order for the spectator, for the visitor to always be surrounded by her gaze, whether it's something um, that's something that Dennis was also talking about in, in the beginning of, of, of today about Theodore Adorno and working through the past and working with the past, whether this is just something we have to deal with, her gaze, we have to live with it. You can see perhaps a little bit around her eyes on the bottom lid and on the top lid, you can see the darker spots. And interestingly, Krista was so magnetized herself by Monasterski's stare that she rubbed off her, her arm. So these, um, these little dots are actually traces of her own blood. And then here we have two artworks, one by Sergei Loznitsa um, called um, Old Jewish Cemetery. And it's a video work uh, created as an homage to the Old Jewish Cemetery that's located, if I'm not mistaken, between Teas and uh, Ebreus. Ebreu Street in uh, Riga. Um, and on the opposite wall, we have an artwork that was created by various students from um, universities in the United States. They're all unified by one professor in the University of Wisconsin who has this research project that um, 
travels around Europe. Uh, it's a radar that's able to penetrate the ground. So it's called ground penetrating radar and it can read the data through the ground. So this group came to the old Jewish cemetery and um, scanned the ground. Um, in particular, we know that from, from one of the eyewitnesses, the exact spot where bodies were either dragged from the ghetto or where people were murdered on the spot there, we knew exactly where it was. So you can see the darker lines and you can see the kind of U shape that we drew on the on the on the data. This is where um where the the, the old people it's an old Jewish cemetery and and there the it's it has been a burial site since 1700s but we know that graves were dug out from right there and new bodies were put in. Here we have a work by Alba Durbano. Um, who is a German artist, who is one of the first actually digital feminist artists. And she created these data, um, data-based uh, large artworks that, are, that were hanging from the walls, as well as this textile work that you can see here laying on the table. And here you can actually see it being held up. So she came to Riga and she did a performance with a seamstress and out of, sorry, and out of this um, piece of fabric, they've constructed a, a robe like that. So for us, it was that the, the idea that Luba Monastirsky was one of the really pioneers of um, women in textile was really important. So we decided to invite Alba to join this exhibition as a um, as an example of early digital feminist artists who worked with textile. Here we have a artwork by Daiga Grantinia, um, which was really important to us as well. We thought so much about the ground. We thought so much about people who were murdered, Jewish people who were murdered in Latvia and about where they are now. We thought so much about the old Jewish cemetery. And it was really important for us as curators and also to invite the public to look up. And this work is very um, positive. It feels very positive. It feels very light. The material um, at first sometimes seems uh, to be perhaps um, um, glass, but it's actually rubber. So the, the, the installation is modular as well. It completely unfolds, completely unlocks. Uh, it reminded us a lot of the light side, the playful side of the textile, the playful, the playful side of the pattern making. Um, and it kind of makes the visitor look, yes, not only down, but also up. And here we have, um, two artworks by the artistic duo Marian Rose, who are um, well-known Latvian designers and artists. They studied materials by Solomon Levitanos. They spent hours in the library, which we were um, very happy to actually track because we saw that they were taking the books out from the library. Um, so they used the techniques that Levitanos proposed. So the techniques of flexibility, techniques of creating sustainable material. Um, you can see that they used um, textile that's very old fashion, fashioned, which is um, felt, something that's also used by the artist that Dennis mentioned in the beginning of, of the talk today, um, Josef Beuys. But Marian Rose used the juxtaposition of felt and satin to show that perhaps the, the mode in which um, someone Levitanus was teaching perhaps wasn't old fashioned at all. And something that we thought about is the flexibility of material, how important it is. So Marion Rose tried to um, replicate it and continue the, the teaching of Levitanus. And here they also Marion Rose, they took um, objects that they're extremely strict it's a metal ruler 
they bent it and also made it more flexible to show the the playfulness of material, the flexibility of it. And when you stand next to it, you almost want to take it off and perhaps put it around your waist or put it around your neck or to squeeze your arm inside one of those creases because for Salma Levitanos, the material was supposed to always embrace. Embrace is really important to him. So this was the continuation of his thought. And here we have them both together. Um, so through this exhibition, um, it was really important to show the um, knowledge production, knowledge distribution, but also to show how contemporary art can serve as a crucial medium for expressing collective trauma, but also to have a space to hold the trauma together, to mourn together. Artists are always witnesses to history, to trauma, to pain, but they also offer visual narratives that evoke empathy from people who live at the same time with them, but also maybe to people who live centuries after them. And art also exists to provoke cultural discourse, as in the exhibition, Wearable Memory. Um, the, art, the original artworks, the original works by Solomon Levitanos and Lubo Monastirsky existed of course, not only to, but also to provoke the critical discourse with um, the artists that we have invited to join the exhibition. Um, the artists employ diverse mediums, materials from paintings, installations, or multimedia presentations, and they encapsulate the emotional, the psychological toll of these atrocities um, of genocide, of war, of Holocaust. and. I urge everyone and I urge myself, especially right now with the wars that are happening around the world, world and in particular the war in the Middle East, to think about how precarious knowledge, material, um, heritage, archive is. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. That was uh, amazing to see the, these uh, kind of uh, European or international examples and then to kind of zoom in to what you've done here in Latvia with, uh, in collaboration with um, Kim and, and uh, all your you know, other colleagues. So if I'm allowed, uh, I'll ask you a few questions because I know you've, you've spent so much, uh, you know, uh, time actually reflecting about these issues um so i have a few questions um the one would be like how did you when you were creating this exhibition how did you balance these life stories actually craft uh of uh, these jewish uh, histories uh, their stories uh, how and how you decided who is who is going to be these Latvian artists? Um, I don't know, um, recreating it or creating their own artwork inspired by the the family histories by these uh, people that you found. Yeah, thank you for that. I I think in general in my work, I I follow two methodologies methodologies. The first is always community-based work, because I think there's nothing without community, especially when we talk about things like cultural heritage. And the second is fiction as method. Um, I dabble with fiction. I try to write fiction as well. And what I find with, uh, with writing, in particular fiction, is that the character sometimes leads me to their story without me really understanding what it will look like at the end. So the process of building this exhibition was very similar. We started in 2016 when actually Solomon's Levitanos great granddaughter reached out to me accidentally through a mutual acquaintance and asked me, can you help me? Just help me find something about my great grandfather. And from that, we kind of continued. Um, we continued to 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 develop this the idea of it. We came to the Kim Institution. We, yeah, it was it was a long process for I guess 
it's almost 2024 now. So almost eight year long process, but um, it kind of led us exactly where we are and all the artists that um, we asked, it was also kind of semi-accidental, but also we worked with the, one of our curators, Zana Onskula, she's incredible. And she, she, she has a very close contact and very incredible knowledge of contemporary Latvian art. So she was definitely the, 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 the steam engine behind everything. Sorry, I think you're muted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I realized that I just uh, had to find the where, where, where is the microphone? Uh, okay, hi. I have um, yeah. That's a uh, that's amazing balance with these uh, intimate um, histories and and the craft and art. Uh, but if we um, zoom out and talk about the bigger picture, so. Uh, what what do you think? Like, how can contemporary art somehow effectively represent the memory of the Holocaust or genocide without uh, making it trivial or sensation sensationalizing it? You know, or uh, find finding or showing you know only the morbid part in your face because when you look at the uh, contemporary art that is, uh, you see, like in Brooklyn Museum, I uh, saw the exhibition, some other places, it's always, in a way, it is made to shock. Um, so, yeah, my question is, how, where do you think, where the, who are either good examples or how, how to strike the balance? I think a lot of it is just through education. So it's just through silent learning through kind of meditative learning as well so uh for instance uh, one of the artists that um that i mentioned christian voltansky i think his work is kind of more hidden so you don't really know exactly what it is unless you come and and read about it and also i think with with most examples that that i've mentioned today i think everybody's uh I think Doris Salcedo is also an incredible artist. I saw her exhibition in Switzerland in summer and um, it's very peaceful, but it's also really thought provoking. Um, and I think through reading as well, through reading the text, like what, like the text that Dennis mentioned in the beginning. So text by Theodore Adorno or through thinking about Hannah Arendt, because I agree with you a lot of, um, art that has to do with genocide tends to be very spectacular, like a spectacle, um, which is uh, perhaps that's, but that also perhaps um, is the only way to really narrate the story to people who have never heard. Because I think for, for me, growing up in a Jewish family as well, and really um, having so much of my ancestors murdered, not just in Holocaust, but just in anti-Semitic attacks throughout centuries and centuries of plain hatred. I think it's really um, braided into my DNA, so I don't think twice about those things. But throughout the past maybe decade, I've met so many people who are my age, younger than me, older than me, and who, especially people who live, um, you know, across the ocean, and they don't really understand the concept of the Holocaust and they perhaps don't even understand the concept of the genocides that happened closer to them just because capitalism is so hegemonious and it's so easy to forget about pain when you're um, surrounded by instant gratification and instant happiness. So perhaps the real opposite of that instant happiness is the instant shock Uh, yes, exactly. But the, uh, that uh, you don't pay attention to the war or genocide that happened in a way nearby, as we remember when the uh, uh, Russian invasion into Ukraine uh, started and the war there, that there was these all these uh, titles, you know, 
the Europe, a peaceful Europe, uh, you know, the the war interrupted this uh, European peace and you're like, and people, of course, in Balkans are like, hello, um, all these wars and the genocide there, it's, um, you know, they are artists are still reflecting, obviously, about that. Um, so I'll have um, uh, one more question about, uh, so I think in the exhibition that you showed, it's like uh, contemporary art somehow really balances this tension between uh, individual narratives of the, you know, people that they're not survivors, I guess, but they are like just uh, uh, probably we can imagine what happened to their close uh, family, the same as you, you shared with your family. Uh, so there's this balance between this collective memory and and um, kind of way you, you manage to bridge it. But what would you say about this ethics and sensitivity towards these uh, issues of genocide and uh, Holocaust? Um, so what are these ethic considerations that artists should take into account, should they? Uh, when they are creating work connected to the Holocaust or um, what would be the sensitivity that they should um, consider on the subject matter or actually potential impact uh, on survivors and the families. Um, uh, Maya Maya Rosha yesterday had a lecture about the Leopaya, how these uh, photos from Holocaust and Leopaya, uh, these half-naked women are used uh, in memorial or or these narratives added to it and they are in a way misrepresented in a way uh, and they do have relatives they are real people so I don't know what's what is this ethical consideration for you I think when as probably when we were building this exhibition about a year ago I reread a text by Audrey Lord that's called the transformation of silence into what's it called, language and action, or action, language and action. And she has a very famous phrase there that says, um, you know, sentence there that says, um, your silence will not protect you. And I think this is really important. And I think about it a lot in um, my own academic writing as well, when I talk about issues that don't necessarily concern me personally, because of the privileges that I was born into. But but I think it's kind of similar when we're talking about um, artists who don't necessarily have background of genocides that they want to talk about. I think the most important thing is not to stay silent. If all of us decide to stay silent, the knowledge will never be distributed. The knowledge will never be passed. And then I think that shyness and that um, fear or embarrassment or kind of, yeah, I guess fear of, stepping into the territory that's really not our own um i think this is what eradicates the knowledge or eradicates that path for knowledge production so and you know art uh, and especially contemporary art obviously is very very influenced by politics or policies that are happening around us you know first of all who the institutions are given money for how the art is in a way sponsored, um, what are the, I don't know, triggers, influences, something like that. So my guess is very um, kind of personal and pessimistic is that actually the contemporary art that is reflecting about the Holocaust might kind of uh, fade into the background because of the political situation and the war in Gaza and everything like that. Uh, and the themes of... Uh, actually this uh, uh, other either genocides will be highlighted or war will be highlighted because um, uh, there's enough photography and video material very raw and disturbing that is uh, we are surrounded by it so i don't know uh, if you want to look in the future since we are ending this year with this lecture uh, so how do you what do you think what do you see the i don't know the trends the themes, the topics that uh, contemporary artists are now reflecting on. I mean, not since October 7th, but like in like this year or, you know, last few years. Yeah, I think we've seen a lot of political art recently because of the war in Ukraine as well. And so I think this will probably continue. And 
And I, I know there has been a lot of art and a lot of performance that has been related to the situation in Middle East for years, again, not just since October 7th. And um, there are a lot of artists who have been working um, about working regarding topics of uh, political injustice for 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 decades um but i really do hope i think it would be really really heartbreaking that um if artists who are still producing work about for instance holocaust would be denied funding or if artists who are who want to continue yeah, whatever kind of work they're creating regarding uh, their Jewish heritage, if they would lose um, funding or if they would lose kind of platform because of what's happening in the in the Middle East. And I know this is already happening, but I just hope that it just, um, I hope that the sense will kind of, the sense will stay. Yes, and uh, concluding, I'll have a one uh, reflection that we have uh, sent by uh, by uh, the researcher we mentioned uh, from Lepke Memorial, Maya. Uh, she says uh, that uh, your, like Esther's, curated works are a brilliant fusion of history and contemporary art. And it's amazing that neither history nor art suffers. Um, has Esther found a sp special method, secret, attitude that demands excellent results from both researchers of historical material and artists? Is the key to success that the artists themselves also participate in the process of in-depth research? Yeah, for sure. That's such a brilliant question. But f f I think the key to everything is storytelling, because I think everybody loves the narrative and everybody loves um, maybe even turning history into a little bit of romanticized fiction on both sides. So historians and artists. And I think this is exactly where they become one. They become very similar. And as part of our um, exhibition, we also created a symposium. So it was a one day long symposium, which started with um, um, Ilya Lienski, the director of the Jews in Latvia Museum, and um, two people from the uh, um, Latvian National Library, um, discussing um, kind of the, the, the Jewish periodicals and the Jewish books within the collection of the Latvian National Library. And everything and the whole, so we had different artists, different professionals talking throughout the day. And then it all ended with a, with a group of students from the Latvian Art Academy who actually collaborated with us and created a just whimsical um, performance for the exhibition opening. And I think creating spaces like that giving everybody platform for a little bit of humor, for some storytelling, for networking, for sharing knowledge, but also um, finding similarities and to really understand that it's not two separate worlds and actually artists and academics are actually very similar kind of people and maybe are, they're actually the same. I think this has been a really important method for me, just bringing humor, humor and stories into it. So humor and stories, that sounds amazing, especially um, if we are dealing with a pretty heavy, you know, uh, art matters, you know, or the loaded, very loaded uh, topics. So my last question is, um, before I let you go and you can get prepared for New Year's, you know, uh, that would be about uh, what are the bad examples you've seen when museums are curating exhibitions connected to the uh, genocide or Holocaust themes uh, and what would be your I don't know the highlights or some some points what would help actually the for curators to think how to how to make this exhibition I don't know the uh, powerful or working for you know for contemporary visitors I think it's hard to say bad because I think all inform all knowledge is wonderful in my opinion. 
I think there definitely have been exhibitions that have been maybe less interestingly curated, let's say. I have seen a couple of exhibitions by an artist whose name is Charlotte Salomon, who is a really important Jewish artist. And I'm a, I'm a big fan. I actually, one of my supervisors was a, a leading, world leading expert on Charlotte Salomon. So I became really fascinated by her work. And I think most interesting ones were the ones that were juxtaposed with other artists or that were more kind of interactive where you could um, even watch a film about her work because there's actually a really wonderful um, animated film about her life that I highly recommend watching. Um, but I've also seen some, some shows or some kind of exhibitions of her work where um, it's just one book of hers, which is basically everything that has remained from her life is one book that's called Life or Theater. And I've seen an exhibition where it's just page by page, which already is fascinating. But for me, someone who has already read it numerous times didn't seem as, as interesting. So I think integration of um, community is really, really fascinating. Integration of um different kinds of mediums as well and also and possibility for visitors to include themselves into the exhibition is always positive. I'm so jealous you've seen that exhibition actually. I have this big book that's published. Of course it's still amazing with the with her, you know, drawings, paintings of her diary, her reflections and uh, God that she was really such a gifted uh, artist. Um, so I wouldn't mind even <laughs> to look at her pages, you know, <laughs> just um, just in the regular, just on the walls. But I understand what you're, yeah, what you're saying, uh, that there needs to be some curated or something to, to, you know, not everyone's ready to just read diary page by page, uh, especially considering her very tragic uh, end of the camp you yeah. know, being pregnant yes so esther i'm very very thankful to you that you could give us this talk uh, it's a good introduction we are gonna have in the middle of january uh, like um discussion uh because eva Talaura, a latvian artist has created the exhibition and there are these uh, similar themes um and i really hope that this was uh, you know, I don't know if you will be able to come to Riga or to see it, but uh, I really hope that uh, this was a great way to kind of um, uh, think and look at that from the from the different angles. So thank you so much. Thank you for you know. Good luck with all your research and uh, and considering uh, scientists and, and researchers' lives. I hope you'll have funding and <laughs> for the next year. You know. Um, yes. yes yes exactly thank you so much for having me thank you thank you for giving me this opportunity and also best wishes to you lots of funding i guess that's what we wish to each other lots of funding health and funding yeah, in order to do things exactly so yeah thank you so much and uh, so thank you for everyone who watched this and we will we will watch maybe later okay thank you bye thank you bye